We're going to begin by using the words of, I will sing the wondrous story, a testimony hymn, and it's about the Christ who died for each one of us. And we stand as we sing. I lead in prayer, uh, you follow, and pour out your heart in thanksgiving to the one who bled and died for you, gave his life that we might live. We might live and have real life here and now and then for eternity, live with him. Father, as we come to you, we thank you that it is a wondrous story, and it's amazing grace. And we want to worship you tonight and thank you for the very fact that that story reached our ears. For many of us at our mother's knee, from the earliest years, we have been aware of that story. And it's just as wonderful tonight as when it impacted us and really caused us to think and turned our minds and our hearts towards a dying Savior, dying in our place, dying for me. And Father, we just thank you that that story is making an impact tonight, has made an impact today already in people's lives, we believe and will do. And we thank you for the Lamb of Calvary. We thank you that we know what we were and we know where we were heading, but it's all different now because of Jesus. Now we know what we are in him, and we know where we're going. 
And Father, we thank you for the transforming power of the gospel and for that transforming work on the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy, sparing us. Thank you for your grace, blessing us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I think we can sing our next hymn, which is the power of the cross. Oh, to see the dawn. And we'll stand as we sing together. Partake of the emblems just at this time, so uh, we'll have the wee word after that, and then we'll sing again. So keep, let us stand as we sing, Oh, to see the dawn. <laughs>
have been following the Lord in those final few days before the cross. We've done so as John describes it to us in his gospel. So we began our journey at chapter 12 when the Lord was there in Bethany. So we're, we were with him in Bethany. And so we've been with him. And in John 17, the last time we looked at this last week, uh, we were with him as he prayed to the Father. And so tonight we're uh, going to read a few verses from John chapter 18. And of course, uh, you'll see there where we're going to be with him as we read these verses together. John 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, that was relating to the prayer that he prayed, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And at verse 4, we're going to see a phrase similar to the one verse 1. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. So that's something found in both verses. Those two words, he went forth, he went forth. He, in other words, stepped forward. He progressed on his journey, but he knew where that journey would lead. He knew all things, verse 4, but he still went forth. If we had read, he went back. What a tragedy that would have been. If we'd read, he knowing all things went back, there'd be no hope for us today. We wouldn't be here. When you think the world's bad, what would it not have been like? The world would have been destroyed. But he went forth. Now, it's not the first time the Lord Jesus went forth because I think of him coming forth from the presence of his father into this world leaving heaven's glory what a distance to come we think about space travel and the distances we marvel at the distances to planets, stars, suns, whatever but to think of the distance in every way imaginable that Jesus traveled in order to come here, the distance between God's holiness and man's sinfulness, the distance between an environment like heaven to an environment like this broken earth, to leave the Father's side and to come and mingle with the likes of us. I think of him going forth from that position on that journey knowing where that journey would take him knowing the people he would encounter on that journey knowing the rejection the mockery the questioning all of the things that he would face on that journey and yet he came with something in mind he came with someone in mind you and me he knew that we would be lost forever if he didn't leave the Father's side and come into this world. What a step. What condescension. That's a big word, but that's really what that is describing. Jesus leaving all that he knew eternally in glory and coming in the form of a man into this world. Any wonder we read in the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or something to be grasped at, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. This one who came from the Father and who went forth from the Father. What, what exactly did that involve? Because he didn't leave the Father's side to then step into a throne or into a palace. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul says, For you know 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for whose sake, our sake, he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. The great creator, the creator of everything, the creator of every precious stone that has ever been mined and could ever be mined, every precious metal, all the other things that are here within our world that are valuable, all those riches he created, and yet he for our sakes became poor. And that was so that we, we mightn't have realized our real spiritual poverty, but that we might be rich in a way that surpasses collecting stuff in a way that surpasses what money can buy. Would you trade the peace of God that you have to be a celebrity without it? Would you trade the forgiveness of sins that you have to be a wealthy person without it? I wouldn't. That he, we, through his poverty, might be made rich. When you think about the dwelling place he left, I hasn't seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what's in glory. And yet he came down into the utility of a humble home, a very humble home, the home of a carpenter in Nazareth. He came unto his own, and he went forth from the Father. This is worse still than, than, than the humbleness of a home. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But the rest of that verse is a marvelous statement, isn't it? But as many as received him, to them gave he the ability, the right, the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. And that's us. That's a wonder. The lawmaker came into this world to be judged by the lawbreaker. He would one day stand before people that he put in place. Isn't it God who sets up rulers and God who puts them down? And he would stand before these people, the Herods, the Caiaphases, the Pilots, and they would judge him and they would abuse him they would think ill of him. And it was he who put them in their place. What condescension. So when I read those words, he went forth, it reminds me that that's not the first time he went forth. He went forth from glory and came into this world. Jesus went forth. And verse 2, Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Can you imagine that? Judas, knowing all the precious times that they'd had in Gethsemane, because we've just been reading, the Lord often went there with his disciples. And how they would have been able to talk to him in a, in a way that they couldn't have done in the public arena. The things they would have talked over, things they would have shared, even just that, which is a sign of true intimacy and true friendship, even that just being together regardless of the topic. Just being there, just being close. A place where time wouldn't be important, isn't that a sign of true friendship? And yet Judas dared to go back there with these officers. Does that not tell you something about the, the heart of Judas at this stage? 
And he comes and they come, the group comes together with lanterns and torches. It was to illuminate their own darkness. It was to illuminate the natural darkness. They were involved in the darkest of deeds. They chose the cover of darkness and yet they needed some light. And they come with their man-made light, their lanterns and their torches. And yet the one they were pursuing was the light of the world. What a sight for all of those individuals who have all since left this world. And they've all since come to realize the dazzling brilliance of the glorified Jesus. And if they have not yet encountered that in eternity, they will at the great white throne. And they'll think of that night they came with their torches and their lanterns. They'll think of that night they snaked their way across the Kidron Valley to try and surprise him with their feeble lanterns and torches. The one that it's said of him, we need no sun or moon and eternity to come. The Lamb is the light thereof. Verse 4, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him went forth and he said to them, whom seek ye? That's a good question too. They just said Jesus of Nazareth but really if they'd thought a wee bit beyond that. But who is Jesus of Nazareth. There was the failure. That was all they saw. A man called Jesus, which was a common enough name in that time. It was a corruption of Joshua, Jehoshua. And he was from Nazareth. Whom seek ye? When we come here on the Lord's Day evening, whom seek we? Is it to once again acquaint ourselves with the, the Lamb? Is it once again to try and get that much needed glimpse of our dying Saviour? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said unto them, verse 5, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Is that not amazing? If you go to the other three Gospels that are written together, they're called the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're written in a certain way. John writes in a different way. And he includes things that the others leave out. For example, John doesn't mention the prayer when he says to the Father, if it be possible, nevertheless not my will but thine be done. But John mentions this. So here they come and he just says three words and it's maybe just actually two. I am. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now we know the value of that. That's precious to us. But here are people who thought they were coming just for an ordinary man. And surely, if they had been officers that had come from the chief priests and Pharisees and so on, they would, they would have known the significance of those words, I am. It was powerful enough to knock them onto their backs. Just What a statement. What power. He says, I am, I am he. What were they looking for? Were they looking to get acquainted with him? No. Were they looking to benefit from his teaching? No. Were they looking to become his followers? No. 
Were they looking to acknowledge him as Messiah? No. Were they looking to identify with him? No. They were there to take him out of the way, to remove him, to get rid of him for those who had sent them. And sadly, there are many today, and that's their whole attitude to Jesus. They just want to make him disappear. They want them out of their moral consciousness. And they're doing that. That's why we see the awful things that we see. The people have Jesus out of their moral conscious. They don't think about him. More and more, they're trying to put him out of our society, out of our schools, out of our laws. But regardless of that, he still says, I am he. They may try to make Jesus disappear. And if they can't do that, then they'll try to make Jesus appear weak. That's not what happened in Gethsemane that night. I am. And they fail. Remember what Jesus said regarding the end. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He says, I am he. He could have said, I am I'm the one that was prophesied. You look through your Old Testament like the Ethiopian eunuch did with Philip the Evangelist that day and you'll see I am he. Think of the two in the road to Emmaus. Jesus began with the scriptures and showed them himself. I am he. I am the one that Isaiah said would be despised and rejected in chapter 53. I am the one, Psalm 41, who would be betrayed by a friend. I am the one, Zechariah 11, who would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. I am the one in Psalm 35 of whom false witness will be born. I am the one who will be silent before his accusers again, Isaiah 53. I am the one, Isaiah said, would be spat upon in chapter 50. I am the one who would be hated without a cause in Psalm 35. I am the one who would be executed with criminals, Isaiah 53. I am the one whose hands would be and feet would be pierced, Zechariah 12. I am the one who would be offered vinegar and gall, Psalm 69. I am the one for whose garments they would gamble in Psalm 22. I am the one whose bones would not be broken, Psalm 34. Jesus could have said, I am he. See all those prophecies? Isn't it great that we can look at that tonight? And we can look back and we can say, that was him. I am he. Here's another I am he. This should encourage us tonight. Jesus himself said this. Not on earth. It's recorded for us by John in Revelation 1. I am he that was dead that's right, but that's not how the verse begins, is it? I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And that's some statement. I am he. Verse 7 of John 18. Then asked the, he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou hast given me, have I lost none. That's taken from his prayer to the Father, of course. So in that sense, he's stepping forward and saying, look, you don't need them. I am he. None of them have the keys of death or hell. What have they done? Certainly none of them could go to the cross and die. I am he. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. 
And then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? There's a comment made by the commentator Adam Clark about that cup. And he says it's maybe an allusion to something in the ancient world as a method of punishing criminals. And a cup of poison would have been placed in their hands and they were obliged to drink it. And he points to Socrates as having been killed by the magistrates of Athens in that very way. But imagine if there were such a cup and a cup of execution, rightful execution for our sins. And we rightfully should have taken that cup full of God's wrath, full of God's judgment and drunk it. But somebody steps in and takes the cup out of our hand and drinks it to the last dregs and there's nothing left for us but that's not all because in its place he doesn't leave us empty handed Psalm 1, 1 6 and verse 13 I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord the psalmist was able to take a cup that was being offered and we have done that haven't we instead of a cup of curse and wrath and death we have taken a cup of blessing, fullness, salvation. Then verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest at the same year. They took Jesus and bound him. The thing is this, he who had caused them to fall back allowed them to bind him. Wouldn't have taken any more power for him to frustrate their attempts to bind him. But he allowed them to bind him. Maybe that's where the hymn writer got the inspiration. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. That's what happened. Then they led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Saviour, so pure and free from sin, they said, crucify him. He's to blame. With him in the garden. May the Lord bless these wee thoughts to our hearts tonight for his name's sake. And now we're going to sing, There is a Redeemer. And towards the end of this hymn, if the servers want to come forward, and prepare the table. And once again, we'll stand to sing lovely words. <laughs>